Well, good morning. morning. All right, let's try this one. You ready? Happy New Year. Year. All right, you get to say it at least once. So it's good to see you guys this morning. We are glad you're here. You survived arrival to a brand new service here at 9 o'clock. Our second service, if you didn't know, it had been about 90% full. And uh, so our folks said, uh, I had folks turning around in the parking lot. I had people call and say, I was going to come today, but uh, uh, the parking lot was too full or I couldn't find a place to sit. And, and I said, well, you can sit up front. There's always room up front. And they're like, but I'm a guest. Your members should sit up front. No, they didn't say that. I, I said that. But anyway, I actually had somebody come to me and say, I brought a guest and they didn't want to sit in the front, so they didn't want to come. And I said, well you tell our members to sit up front and move out of your way. And they didn't like that. So, Are you a visionary? Have you ever thought of yourself as a visionary? You know, somebody one day, Randy, had a screwdriver. And they were putting a screw in and said, You know what? I think we could do this better than this. And then they came up with an electric screwdriver, and then eventually they said, you know, I can do even better than that. And they came up with a battery powered. Somebody had to have a vision for something different. And I am absolutely sure that when they came up with the electric screwdriver, that people said, why would you want to use one of them screw guns? It's so much easier. You don't have to run a cord. You don't have to plug it in. You don't have to do that. I like to do it the old-fashioned way. That's, we ought to stick with the way we've always done it. Because when you do new stuff, it's hard. Anytime you have a vision of changing something in your life, it's going to feel difficult at first or different at first. Anytime you start something new, a new pattern, a new habit, a new way of doing something, or you're going to work on something. Maybe this year you looked in the mirror after all the cookies at Christmas and said, something's got to (laughs) change. What's funny is people will tell me that they don't have vision But I have learned something about life. We are really good about negative visions. And I'll tell you how I know that. Because this morning on the way here, I hit rain on the way here. And I heard the radio report that it's going to rain. And I thought, okay, brand new service, 9 a.m., rainstorm, no one's coming to church. And so on the way here, I I did that. And as I did that, I said, oh no, Eric, you are creating a vision. You have a vision of something that can go wrong. And and you think, well, Eric, that doesn't apply to me. Oh, I'm going to give you one that does. (laughs) Haven't you ever been driving and you pass a police officer and you look down at your speedometer and you go, oh no. And then you have a vision. You start looking in the rearview mirror, and maybe they pull out. And then you start to go, oh, no, I'm going to have to. And you already start imagining yourself pulling over. So I remember being 16 years old. I had a convertible Mustang in Miami. One of my friends was with me. We got off the highway. The mall, Dadeland Mall, was over on the left with three double solid white lines in between. You're supposed to go to the second light. And my friend said, you can make it. Go, go, go. And I crossed three double white lines, turned left into the mall and looked in the rearview mirror and two cars behind me was an officer. So I did what any teenage boy would do. I tried to lose him in the parking lot and and To make a long story short, he found me and was nose to nose with my car and asked me to get out of the car. So I got out of the car and I immediately had a vision of my dad killing me and me dying that day. Now, by the way, this friend who told me go, go, go is now a colonel in the military. He is a three star, three star colonel, is that or three star general? Is that what you do? Three star general? He's a he's important. I'll show you his picture later if you can tell me what military thing he's doing. He's doing something important. I'm thinking, but he led me into sin. And I thought, sure enough, I'm going to get a ticket. My dad's going to take away my license. I'm going to lose my car. I mean, I had all these visions of what could go wrong. But thankfully, on that day, a Japanese family was visiting Miami. 
And they came running up with cameras and asked the officer to reenact arresting somebody. And so he put me against the car. He acted like he was going to put the cuffs on me. He took pictures next to me. And then he said these words to me, have you had enough punishment? To which, of course, I said, yes, I did. And he said, you can go. So somewhere, I imagine, I have a vision, somewhere in Japan, on somebody's coffee table, is a picture of me being fake arrested by an officer, but they saved me from a ticket. And I'm so grateful for that family to this day. Because I would not be with you right now if it wasn't for that family. But it was funny how quickly, when that policeman got behind me, that I had a vision of everything that could go wrong. So here's what I want to challenge you to do today. As we start in the book of Nehemiah and we look at this idea of creating a vision and starting off the right way, and how, is there a vision that God has on your life? Or have you allowed God to begin to put vision for your neighbors and vision for your friends and outside of just a vision for yourself, have you begun to ask God, God, I want a vision bigger than just me and my. God, I want a vision for what you want to do through me. And so as we look at that today, I want to look at this idea of starting out and how you can start. And by the way, this uh, uh, sermon series works for a vision from God. But if you decided this year you want to have some new habits, this series, as we talk about it, there's things in here that you can use for maybe starting a new habit in your life. Or maybe losing weight. Or maybe for you, it's something else. Maybe you've decided to read books or spend time in the Bible this year or spend time in prayer. All of these principles that we're going to look at work in any change, anything that you want to bring into your life. And the very first step is the most important. It's asking God. God, I want to ask you what you want me to do. God, I want you to show me your part in my life and what he wants me to do. So let's pick this up today knowing that God wants to work in your life. And if you're going to start out, I want you to know God's plan for you. So we're going to talk about first steps to getting on track. So if there's an area of your life that you feel off track, this will work for that. But maybe you haven't even thought about this. So my prayer is before you leave here today, maybe you'd begin this year by saying, God, would you give me a vision for what you want in me? Number one, evaluate In God's presence. Let's pick up Nehemiah chapter 1, 1 through 4. And we're going to be going through the book of Nehemiah here the next few weeks. Here we go. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. You say that one. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year. While I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanina, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. So you can remember Old Testament, we talked not too long ago, about Daniel and his three friends that were taken out of Jerusalem when Babylon came, the walls came down. That was when Jerusalem began to go into exile. And so now we're on the other side of the exile where God is now calling his people back out of exile, and Nehemiah knows that this is God's plan, and so he says, let's see what's going on over there. And so some people are still there. Obviously, we know Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or as Steve likes to call them, Horshach, and what other two names he had. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. Now, time out. I want you to think about that. That means that not only marauders, not only criminals, not only armies can invade the city at any time, but it also means that animals can come into the city. It means that if you had a house there or if you had a place there or you were doing business there, you never knew when a lion or a tiger or a bear might come through. So the walls are down, but also the gates are down. There's nothing stopping anything from coming in. And so it continues. When I heard these things, listen to what he did. I sat down and wept. For some days, what did I do? I mourned and fasted 
and prayed before the God of heaven. So what was he doing? He was evaluating what was going on, and it so upset him that he sat in God's presence. He said, God, this is what's happening. Now, I don't know if you have a situation in your life right now that's upsetting. Most of us have something. Maybe it's a relationship with somebody. Maybe it's a frustration at work. Maybe it's a situation with a neighbor. Maybe it's a health issue you have going on. Have you taken time yet to present that request to God? To sit before Him as you evaluate. And if you're like me, you come up with a negative vision. We, we all do. Listen, we all have Google. So, right, we find a little spot on our hand and we go, huh, spot on hand. And inevitably, Google tells you it's what? You got cancer, you're going to die. And so you immediately go, oh, no, right? And so we tend to do that. And instead, we need to first start out going, God, you know about this situation. You know about this circumstance. You know about this health issue. You know about this financial issue. You know about this job issue. God, I sit before you with this. I present it to you. I'm evaluating what's happening in your presence. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't do anything. We're going to talk about kind of what comes next. I love this verse in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It's this idea of trusting God. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. Is there anything you need to surrender to him? Maybe you don't have a vision from God yet. Zig Ziglar talked about when he realized uh, at the beginning of a year that he needed to lose weight. He didn't just sit and think about how fat he had gotten. He went and found a picture of a skinny guy before the internet. And he took that picture and he put the picture of the skinny guy on the refrigerator. Why? Because he didn't want to just look at himself. He wanted to look at what could be. Have you looked at your life and understood not only who you are, but what God can do with you and how God can fix a situation, a circumstance. That prayer request that you have thought about, that thing that you've worried about, when's the last time that you just took that and submitted it to God so that He could straighten out your path? You know, one of the purposes of a daily quiet time where you spend time in the Bible So it refocuses you on what matters. And you spend time in prayer, so you not only pray for your needs, but you spend time lifting up your friends to God. One of the purposes of that is to submit everything to God every day. One of the reasons we do that is so that we understand, God, you're in charge of my life, and I'm going to every day acknowledge that. Number two, so not only do we evaluate in God's presence, we honor God and admit sin. You ever been overwhelmed by life? You ever get overwhelmed suddenly? Like you were doing great and you thought everything was fine and then you had one of those three in the mornings. (gasps) Were you just worried about everything at three in the morning? How many of you worry in the middle of the night? You ever do the middle of the night worry? If you don't, God bless you. That's wonderful for you. But some of us wake up in the middle of the night. We go to bed and we're fine. There's nothing wrong. We're like, Jesus, I love you. Thank you for tonight. And in the middle of the night, we go, what am I going to do about that? And then we can't sleep. And then we're frustrated. That is normal for humans sometimes to get out of that trusting God and to then need to surrender to him again. You know, one of the things that's easy to do, too, is to get a negative vision about life and to be worried. When we worry, our vision, we we are able to create that negative vision. But I want you to imagine something this year that could happen if you're faithful to God. I want you to imagine that neighbor that hasn't come to church in years. And that you get an opportunity to invite them one day and you say, you know, I, I go over to Surfside, you're, you're welcome to come sometime. And the neighbor looks at you and goes, oh, okay, that sounds good, I'll go. What? Oh, I mean, great. And that neighbor comes and you're thinking, oh, Lord, help them to get a parking space when they get here. And they get here and they get to park right up front because some of you guys parked away from the doors. And so they're like, God must want me here. You're like, Yes. Then they come in and they're greeted by somebody. Bob and Marianne have made sure that they're greeted at the door and everybody says hi to them and welcomes them and 
loves them and encourages them. And then they say, oh, you know, there's coffee back there. And the guy's like, what? Man, I go all the way to Starbucks for coffee and I can come here. Gets a cup of coffee. Maybe they drop their kids off in the children's ministry and then show up for church. And then God changes their lives. All because some people went out of their way. See, if we begin to get a vision for why we go out of our way for people, it makes us not wake up in the morning and go, oh, good Lord, it's morning. Instead, of we, we say, good morning, Lord. Lord, use me today. Listen to what happens next. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his command, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying. Before you, day and night for your servant, the people of Israel. So what does he do? He's acknowledging God, how powerful God is, how mighty God is. And then listen to what he does. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself. By the way, uh, be careful of any pastor who loves to point out other people's sins, but doesn't point out their own. There's a lot of guys making a lot of money today, and all they do is rail on society and society's sins. Nehemiah didn't say the Babylonians. Nehemiah didn't say these people over us. You know what Nehemiah looked at? God, we're messed up. And then it says, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We've acted very wickedly towards you. We've not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. You know, one of the best things you can do every day is say, God, is there any sin between you and me? God, is there any selfishness in my life? Because here's the truth. Sin makes us selfish and self-centered. You will never get God's vision for your life as long as you're constantly pursuing your desires, your goals, your dreams, your passions, your lust. When you begin saying, God, forgive me for those things. God, I want to follow you. I want to do what you've called me to do. When we begin to do that, then we get to get, begin to get a vision for our neighbors. Then we begin to get a vision for our families. We begin to say, God, what can you do? How can you use me to be a blessing? God, how can you use me to help people find their way home? God, how can you work in my coffee? How can you work in this area of my life? In 1 John 1, 9, it says this, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let me tell you why I threw that verse in here. Because here's what happens. We either ignore sin in our life and don't do anything about it. We just kind of like, well, I don't notice anything. Or we sit over here in our sin and we say, God can't use me for anything. I'm so messed up. I'm so broken. I'm such a failure. I, I, I disappoint God all the time. We just sit over here in this. And the enemy loves that. He wants you to be sitting around going, God can't use me. I'm just an awful person. But that's why we have to recall, when you confess our sins, what happens? He is faithful. He is just. He's forgiving our sins. He's the one who's renewing us and using us. And so when you confess it, now you can get over here and go, okay, God, I, I've confessed where I was and you're going to use me. Thank you for your forgiveness. When's the last time that you really received God's forgiveness? Some of you are very good at confessing sins, but you're terrible at receiving forgiveness. God, I receive your forgiveness. I thank you for your love. I don't know why you would forgive me, but you said that you do. And so by faith... I receive your forgiveness. And then you can begin to get a vision for other people because God is changing and purifying your heart. Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. Number three, remember his power and your position. Do you know God has you where he has you for a purpose? People all the time say, Pastor, I'd love you to meet my neighbor and invite him to church. And I'm like, your neighbor has no idea who I am and could care less and may meet me and go, I would never come to your church. Actually, that might really happen. The truth is, they know you. And that's the good news and the bad news, right, for some of us. And the truth is, God's placed you where he's placed you for a purpose, to be a blessing to the people around you, to help the people around you, to be Jesus' hands and feet 
everywhere you go. You, this week, will contact people and be, in touch, and be able to bless people that I will never meet. And you'll have the opportunity to reach out to them, to encourage them, to go out of your way for them. And so one of the things I've tried to do as a pastor is look for opportunities to get outside the walls of the church. Over time, what happens to pastors all the time is they be, the, uh, pastors become monks in a monastery. If we're not careful, the only people we'll talk to are people from the church. The only people we'll interact with are pastors that we know or friends that we know. And over time, what happens is we become more and more isolated and insulated. On the way here last night, I was thinking about one of the ladies that helps uh, uh, in our church that used to be a part of our Rotary group. And I joined Rotary only to get outside of the church. I wanted to find out who was in the community and look for ways to serve outside of the church. Last night on the way to church, I was thinking about this lady who now helps at our church and, and, and recruits people. And then I realized there are 10 different people that come to our church now that were either part of Rotary or their families are related to them from Rotary. Do you realize that God can use you in the exact same way? As you go out of your way in your community, at your workplace, in other places, to just say to people, hey, my pastor's crazy. You'd fit right in. And most of your friends, if you have friends like I do, most of your friends would be like, that sounds like the place for me. I have a guy that's in our Rotary who actually invited me to Rotary that went here to church, and that's the reason I started going to Rotary. And I tell him all the time, dude, you are the best non-example in our whole church. And he goes, I am. You're right. If I can go to church, anybody can go to church. And so look for those opportunities. Listen to what happens next. Remember the instruction you gave your servant. Verse 8. Moses saying, if you're unfaithful, I'll scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then I will, excuse me, even if your exiled people are the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Basically, God, you said you'd bring us back. They are your servants and your people whom you redeem by your great strength and mighty hand. Now, what's he doing? He's acknowledging how great God is. Not how great he is but how great God is. And then he continues. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor. When's the last time you said, God, would you give me favor with people as I talk to them today? Would you give me favor with my neighbor? Would you give me favor with this family member that I've been looking for an opportunity with? And then he continues. Give your servant success by granting him favor in the presence of this man. And then he says this, I was cupbearer to the king. Nehemiah is saying, this is who I am. This is what I do. God, you can use where I am for your glory. So my question to you is this. Where has God placed you? Who are you connected to? Who's in your life? Even if you're just a cupbearer. By the way, what a job. You know what a cupbearer did? The cupbearer would come in and say, King, I have your wine here for you. And the king would look at him and go, You try it first. Oh, okay. Right? Or, okay, looks good. That's what the cupbearer did. And so a cupbearer actually was not just in charge of that cup. He actually would, if he was a good, smart cupbearer, he actually watched the wine from the time it was grapes until it got to the cup because he didn't want to die. And so Nehemiah was not just in charge and just in the presence of the king. He also had connections to other people. And you know what? God's getting ready to use all those connections he had, including being the cupbearer to the king. And having those few minutes as the king watched to see if he was going to die. Doesn't that sound like a great job? To say to the king, king, it's time for us to go back. God, would you grant me wisdom? God, would you grant me favor? Who is it in your life that you need to ask God to give you an opportunity to fix something? Or to share with. 
What situation is going on in your life right now that when you look, you're overwhelmed by it? And you can start to say, you know what, God? All I am is a servant. But God, you use servants all the time. If you don't think that's true, look at what Paul said. Well, that's from the last... So, let me tell you what happened just now. Normally, the service starts at 10, and so Randy had the countdown on automatic. So, at 10 o'clock, it said, Pastor, get off the stage. All right, so here we go. You can just do that every week, and that'll be a hint for me. Just leave that in. Listen to this. This is Paul, Ephesians 3, 7, and apparently, there it is. All right, here it is. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. I want you to notice the two things there, and I want you to pray that God would give these to you. First of all, Paul just acknowledges, I'm just a servant. The guy who wrote a lot of the New Testament is saying, I'm just a servant. But what does he say? He says, first of all, God, I need your grace. And then he says, and God, I need your power. And you and I need the exact same thing. Do you want God to use you this year in situations and circumstance? Do you want God to give you his peace even as you walk through difficult things and frustrating things and struggles and challenges? God, I need your grace and I need your power. I pray this year that you'll begin to pray, God, give me a vision for what you want for me. And if you'll surrender to that, you know, as we started this new service this morning, a lot of people surrendered extra time in their life. A lot of people surrendered extra time in order to be here. They really went out of their way. Why? Because they need something else to do? No, because they realize when I surrender my time to God, God can use it to help friends and neighbors come to Christ for eternity. And I have the vision long term that church members will be sitting around a table in heaven and looking across the table at somebody who says, thank you for sacrificing. I'm here today because you sacrificed and went out of your way to be a blessing to other people. That's the vision I have for our church, and that's the vision I have for you. If you're here today and you never surrendered your life to Christ, my biggest vision for you is that you'd come home to him knowing that he loves you and cares about you, but you can't make it to heaven on your own. You have to surrender to him. And so today, if you're ready to surrender to him, I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to surrender to Christ, to know that he died and rose again for you. Or if you're here today and the truth is your vision's been more about you than about God, then maybe today would be the start of, God, I want your vision for my life, not just my vision for my life. And the truth is, if you surrender to his vision, your life will be better than it would ever be without it. Let's close in prayer today. Father, thank you for this time together. I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that we would have a vision for what you want to do in our lives. Your plan for our lives would become clear. Lord, as we start out a new year and we have this kind of dividing point, I pray that we could look back and see what you have done because we surrendered our lives to you. Help us to walk in you in power Help us to walk in you as we surrender to your power in our lives. Lord, thank you for each one. Lord, thank you for blessing us with so many folks who go out of their way to use their gifts. Lord, continue to bless them. Continue to strengthen those who are weak, to encourage those who are downtrodden. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have our time of offering now.